before you can get the most out of your data, you actually have to have a strategy, right? You have to come up with a data-driven strategy that's going to help you make these decisions moving forward. And I think we can all agree that's easier said than done, which is why we've brought two very smart, experienced people to our conversation today. Um, today's episode is going to be called Where Data Strategies Go Wrong, Tales from the Front Lines. And both of these gentlemen have been on the front lines. And so I think what they have to offer to our conversation today is going to be very, very valuable. First up, I want to bring in Anthony Palacio. He is Talon's Senior Manager of Strategic Planning and Analytics. Hey, Anthony, how you doing? Uh, hey, Jeff. I'm doing well. How about you? I'm, I couldn't be better, to be honest, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. You, you've got a, a wide range of experience when it comes to driving strategy for businesses of all kinds. Yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, first of all, happy to be here. Uh, thanks for having me as part of this discussion. Um, but yeah, like you said, uh, I've been in, in data for quite some time now. Um, I started my career with um, ExxonMobil, and I was in their central analytics organization there, uh, basically partnering with the business um, to support their operations and also uh, having an eye on the long-term strategy and the vision for how we want to use data internally at the company. Um, I then pivoted and moved to Stitch. Um, and so from that perspective, I got to contrast the large enterprise experience with a fast uh, growing startup. And when I joined, I joined as a one person data team. And so I got to experience all the challenges that come along with that. And um, uh, Talon, uh, Stitch is now part of Talon and I'm on the go to market strategy team. And so it's been a really great opportunity to continue to challenge the business to use data in new ways. And also, again, keep a focus on the long-term strategy for how we want to use data within the company. And I bet it's been super helpful that you've worn a lot of hats, right? Uh, you've you've yes. kind of seen the, the building of a strategy from every single level. Uh, for the benefit of our audience, um, we'd also not only like to know the experience and the uh, your, your career accolades, but a little bit about you, Anthony. So I'm always asking people, what's one little tidbit about you? Uh, personally, uh, a hobby or, a, a, you know, a passion in your life that uh, will kind of round you out as a personality today? <laughs> um, I, so something, one thing that I guess no one would know about me from looking is I love playing music. I play a lot of different instruments. And um, so I play guitar, uh, ukulele, bass. Um, I also know to play the piano um, and I play drums as well. And actually I played saxophone. So uh, a lot of insurance. <laughs> Man, you just ran the gamut. I mean, are we going to have some kind of jam session maybe after this? Maybe we can uh, yeah, for, if add we're, a little time. We'll say five minutes at the end and uh, I'll play Fair it. Fair enough. Show. All right. <laughs> All right, get get your uh, get your reed warmed up, I guess, <laughs> for your saxophone. <laughs> That'd be cool. Also, want to bring in another uh, one of our experts, Garrett O'Brien. Uh, welcome, Garrett. You are a senior product managing uh, marketing manager at Talent. Uh, tell us a bit about your journey. What's your experience been? Yeah, um, I've been in data for roughly five years in a couple different capacities. Um, so, I, as you mentioned, work on the product marketing team in our. SMB or growth segment. So I spend a lot of time talking to customers who are that one person data team like Anthony was all the way up to just about pre IPO and IPO stage companies that are you know really making a strategy out of their data. Um, and before that, I worked as a data analyst uh, in a consulting capacity for um, some of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. So I've got a little bit of uh, the gamut as well. Um, I'm going to get ahead of your question and, and answer. My fun fact is uh, that I have not cut my hair since the pandemic. So Really? Uh, well, I, I had a little scissor trim here and there, but I've uh, been going strong. So Anthony and I are roughly on the same page with the hockey hair. I was going to say, I think we have two of the finest heads of hair and talent. I mean, just here and, and me, I just kind of wake up and hope it doesn't make anybody mad. Uh, so, great, yeah. Oh, well, I, I wasn't fishing for a couple, but I'll absolutely take it. I also want to uh, compliment you on your wall art, man. I don't know if you're doing some kind of uh, uh, <laughs> exploration of uh, mechanics or what have you, but I just love those tires that are hanging on no, the back. No modern art, just a cycling addiction uh, and hobby. Behind me is my tiny apartment full of uh, cycling gear. So cool. Yeah. 
Right. And so you ride real fast and that hair just whips in the wind and it just makes for great YouTube. Videos. I guess so. I like to think that way. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, we've got two two of the best possible people we could have for this conversation. Let's let's jump in. And I want to start with you, Anthony, really quick. I mean, we've talked about your wide, wide range of uh, experience. Um, so I, I think we can all safely say that, you know, we live in a very data driven culture, right? Um, but coming up with that strategy can be tricky business. Um, there's no clear vision, or if you don't have a data leader, how, how do organizations get that ball rolling? Yeah, I mean, I first, I definitely would have to agree with you. Um, you know, data plays a huge role, no matter what size company you have, if it's small, uh, large, especially today, uh, with especially like the ease of getting of uh, acquiring data. It's just, it's become a really central part of, of running a business. Um, and I think the challenge, like you said, is if you don't have a data leader, um, I think it really comes down to the fact that a data leader has so many um, key responsibilities in a business um, primarily. And this is something that like, isn't often thought about, but like the, the data leader has this responsibility to communicate the value um, that they're, that the company is getting from data. Um, data doesn't speak for itself. And so it really relies on a strong leader to go back to the business and, and say like, this is where, this is what we're getting from the data that we're collecting. Um, and I think they have the responsibility of tying that back to, again, like an overarching strategy. And so without like a strong data leader in the company, um, it can be really difficult to get that strategy off the ground. So it seems like maybe the battle's already starting even before you've got your army together, right? In, in a lot of ways, you know, if, if you can't get in line with who's going to be the voices of this, of this strategy, uh, do you feel like that kind of gets in the way of people's uh, progress? Does it get in the way of their confidence and being able to build a strategy? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, um, you know, like tying back to the title of uh, from the front lines, you know, sometimes it does definitely feel like a, a battle we're, we're fighting here. And um, I would say like, just like the field of working with data is just, uh, it's a hard field to work in, you know, um, we're answering open-ended business questions. And so just the, the day-to-day of, of working with data is a difficult thing, but then building a strategy around that becomes even more challenging because there's so many pieces uh, involved, right? There's people that we have to work with. There's, there, we're oftentimes trying to build a culture around, centered around data. And that, that's a challenge in itself. And then there's a process that has to be built around that to support all of those things. And so, um, so yeah, there's just like a lot of moving pieces when it comes to putting together a data strategy. Yeah. And I can imagine that the challenges, I mean, in both your experiences, I imagine the goalposts are always moving on you a little bit. Right. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about those challenges. Um, but talk a little bit before we start jumping into some of these specific challenges that we want to bring up. Um, the strategy really is the foundation, right? I mean, do you think, um, you know, cart before the horse kind of thing, you really can't face the challenges until you have the strategy in order to be able to attack those challenges, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, data strategy definitely comes first. And, you know, it's also, you know, it's like the hard part. It's also the, also the hard part of the equation, right? And um, there's a lot of problems that you can run into along the way. Um, but I'd say the good thing about it, like the optimistic side of this is that, if you know what to look out for, um, some of these pitfalls that you might fall into, um, you know, you can avoid these problems or mitigate them um, as long as you're kind of like prepared for them. And so that's why I'm really excited today to talk about, um, have this discussion around where companies can go wrong, um, what to look out for. And um, I'm really happy to share my perspective on this. And I, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Garrett's uh, point of view as well. Very cool. Yeah. I, and at the outset, we, we promised specifics, right? We promised uh, that we weren't going to talk from a 30,000 foot level. So let's talk about some of those specific pitfalls. Um, what are some examples that folks should look out for? Yeah, sure. So I one that um, I'd like to start out with here is this idea of thinking about data last. Um, it's one that it, that's near to me because um, it can be a source of frustration from a data professional's point of view. Um, you know, when you're brought into a discussion or a project um, after decisions have already been made, it puts the data team in a really tough position. Um, you're forced to think on your feet. You're forced to kind of put together reports um, and find ways to 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 calculate metrics to measure the to, uh, to measure the success of a project. 
Um, and a lot of times you're forced to uh, find workarounds to problems that could have been addressed if, if data had been involved in the very early stages of planning. Um, so this idea of thinking about data last is definitely uh, a really important piece of getting the strategy right. Um, and, and it's really important for the business to see uh, the data team as a partner versus a request uh, fulfilling organization. Um, that, that is certainly key to finding success in this area. Yeah, I, I, that's a great point. I think, you know, and as, as always, we always want a real business outcome, right? We want our data to drive results, right? So, but I imagine, I mean, within an organization, even SMBs, you know, you've got different stakeholders who want different things and different results and different outcomes based on what their needs are within their organization, right? A CMO is going to look for something different than the CIO or the COO or all the C-levels or anybody else that's a part of that data process. So, how do you how do you do that? I mean, I imagine you've got to build relationships. You've got to have conversations with a lot of different people throughout the organization. How do you build the the team? How do you build your data leaders? Yeah. So, um, I yeah. So, like you said, I I couldn't agree more. I mean, so much of this hinges on relationship building and build. You know, having strong relationships with the different partners around the business. Um, I would say data champions, uh, data leaders have this responsibility of you have to raise this question about data early and often constantly in, in conversations. And I would say there's, um, I would say there's like different sets of responsibilities when it comes to whether you're a leader or an analyst. Um, you know, if you're a one, if you're the sole data person in a, in a company, then you are the leader, right? So, uh, but basically I would say there's a couple different responsibilities that you have to think about depending on your role within the organization. I'd say as data leaders, uh, there's a responsibility to, um, to again, like force those relationships with with the other business leaders around the table, so that you can get your seat at that in that discussion early on. Um, and I think the important thing as a data leader is that, like you said, if you're talking to like the CRO, for example, um, you have to. It's your responsibility to tie back um, to always keep the business question in mind and try to understand like what is the key um, goal that the CRO is really going for, right? So if it's a CRO, the goal is revenue. And you have to you have to be the one to tie back your data expertise to um, how we can drive revenue. Um, so you have to ask the right questions and um, don't rely on the business to kind of ask those questions to you. I would say like take a proactive role in that. Um, and as analysts, right? So that was from the leadership perspective. As an analyst, um, you have an, that's where the requests are usually coming in <laughs> from the business. And so as an analyst, like you have a responsibility not to just don't, you know, don't just take requests in, spit answers out. Um, you, you kind of have to think one level up and always tie it to a business challenge. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's how you can kind of foster this relationship of a business partner rather than just somewhere, uh, a team that everyone else can just go to with small questions here and there. Yeah, it's that difference between being a service center and being a trusted partner, right? Um, yeah, and that's how you really get collaboration. Um, absolutely. Or true collaboration. Yeah. Do you find that hard to do? I mean, you know, again, these folks all have different agendas in some way. I mean, everybody wants what's best for the business, but do you find in your experience that's kind of hard to do to bring everybody to the table a little bit? Uh, it definitely can be hard to do. Um, it, it, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. And uh, it's also, it can also be a source of frustration. It can lead to like this, like, us versus them mentality, right? When you're not, you don't feel like you're building the, you know, that you're not being viewed as a business partner, but um, I would say just keep working at it. I mean, it's at the end of the day, like we're all in the same company, we're all working towards the same goal. And so I think keeping that in the back of your mind constantly. Um, and again, in these discussions, like presenting yourself, not as just as a data expert, but also as a business expert that understands how to drive growth in a business. Um, yeah. And it really kind of proves that point of that, how, how important data is in every single nook and cranny in the corner yes. of the business, right? I mean, everybody sure. has, a, has a stake in, in what this data is. Um, let's move on to another pitfall. Um, I, I, this one's very interesting to me, the idea of uh, folks overestimating their data readiness, right? Again, cart and horse thing. We're dealing with that. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I really love this one as well. Um, and I think there's a couple sides to this. Um, so there's there's uh, there's two important pieces to this this idea of overestimating your data readiness. So um, first, I think it's really having the discipline to 
to have a realistic view of where you are today, super important um, because it helps you measure progress. And then I think the second part of overestimating your data readiness is um, it's kind of this idea around um, focusing so much on this future state. So it's important to have an idea of where you want to go and have a real, realistic view of where you are today. But at the same time, um, you shouldn't focus so much on where you want to go that you fail to recognize um, valuable progress that's being made along the way. Um, you know, there was a survey uh, by McKinsey and it, it came out saying that 61% of customers or companies are still taking an ad hoc approach to analytics. And I think that actually offers like a really optimistic view for a lot of companies out there. If you're early on in your data journey, that, um, you know, there's a lot of companies in the same uh, place as you. And so it's really important that we take, uh, that we kind of focus on the baby steps that we can make along the way and the progress that comes along with that. Um, and, you know, just enjoy the, the, the data journey that you're on. Um, you don't have to be the top notch uh, data company out there to, um, to get value out of your data. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. I mean, everybody wants to be completely 100% data driven, right? But how realistic really is that? And it's okay <laughs> exactly, to admit yeah. that it's a journey, right? I mean, you're not going to get there in one day. Um, so having said that, I mean, what approaches do you think companies should take uh, as they look to, you know, the ultimate goal is 100% data driven and, and, and business outcomes across the board, right? But as we start that journey, what do those steps look like for customers? Yeah, so I, I, I can speak to this from experience, um, you know, joining Stitch as a as like a one person data team. Um, you know, I think there's uh, there's an important. So, again, like, again, focusing on small steps and focusing on the progress that comes along with those steps is important. Um, but especially if you're in a smaller team at a growing company, I think it's really important to nail down the essentials. So, right, you have to collect data first. Um, and once you collect it, you have to uh, have a good place to store it that can scale with you as you grow. Um, you have to focus on transformation and like what data sources should be combined together to get the valuable insights. And then uh, you need to focus on building out key reports that you need to measure your business. And um, once you have those key reports, make sure they're shareable, make sure, and like what we did at Stitch is we focus on automation. Um, so automation as much as possible uh, to remove daily tasks so you can focus on longer term like more vision strategic um initiatives yeah i mean um, any any journey you need a map right i mean to be able to you know it's a lot easier to be able to take those steps if you know that there's an outcome if you know that there's a place to get right yeah exactly and you know i would say like the day-to-day -day aspect of of working in data can take up a lot of time um like one of the things i experienced at stitch being the one person analytics team is like we use Stitch ourselves. So for people on the call that might not be aware, Stitch is and Stitch, the product that we offer is actually an, um, it's an it's a tool that helps you load data into your warehouse uh, very easily. And so I would use that myself as a way to offload this entire portion of the of the analytics process from my plate uh, while still maintaining a lot of control and not having to rely on a separate team to provide data to me. So it was a great way for me to kind of build a lot of control around the process, but also save time from the, from the details of the implementation so I could focus on all of the more um, strategic, more what I would say valuable portions of, of that analytics journey. Yeah, and I think that's good news, especially for SMBs where, you know, you may be wearing a lot of hats, right? You may be the only yeah, analytics exactly. person within your organization to know that, that, that this is still very possible to create a strategy. Uh, even if you're kind of running the show as a one or two or three person team, right? For sure. Yeah. Let's, uh, Gary, I want to bring you in. Let's let's talk about another common pitfall. Um, and this one, I act actually, I would love to understand what this means. Uh, this <laughs> idea of failing to think from first principles. Um, yeah. It sounds kind of like what my mom and dad used to lecture to me at a dinner table, you know, where, you know, <laughs> you should know who you are. You should know, you know, <laughs> all that kind of thing. Talk, talk a little bit about that in the business sense. Yeah, this is like a bit of an abstract, like college philosophy thing, but I promise I'll make it real. Um, <laughs> Good. So it's actually, first principles is an idea that you, you know, Anthony, you talked about like working in data, you get asked hard questions all the time and have to solve ambiguous problems. First principles is the idea of taking 
a, an ambiguous problem and breaking it down into chunks that are much smaller and more solvable and you make progress towards the bigger question. Um, another way I've heard this said is by taking a single question and just asking why until you get to the root of it. Um, and I, I wanted to give an example because in my work, I talk to folks that are very much on that one person data team um, or you know, maybe they're a very junior person joining for the first time. And then I also talk to folks on the you know, uh, startup rocket ship, super stardom of you know, being a data leader. And um, one of the things that, that people in that latter category do really well um, that are more seasoned is ask this question, ask why when the business presents them with problems. Um, the canonical example for me is uh, streaming data is a really hot topic. Um, and I have heard like more times than I can count from folks working in data that maybe a CMO or a CRO comes to them and says, hey, we need you know, some sort of real-time uh, reporting based on a, a streaming data infrastructure that we want you to go build so that you can like serve us literal real-time insights. Um, and a, a junior person might hear that and start sweating because they know it's going to take like six months and collaboration with engineering to build something like that and then it might break and, and so on. Um, but folks that are a little more experienced or savvy might turn that ask on its head and just start asking why. And there are plenty of good reasons why you might want to build re real-time reporting, right? If you are running customer support at Uber and you need to know as soon as there are support issues in a certain area, because you have to act on it in a matter of minutes, great use case, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that probably is only 10% <laughs> of the use cases. And a lot of them are, you know, streaming with, or sorry, real time with quotation marks because, you know, that CMO or that head of sales or whomever would be equally as satisfied with five minute latency, 10 minute latency, things that you can do a lot more easily with tooling that's available to you as a data worker. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, my recommendation for folks listening is to take that next step and build that relationship with your business counterpart. Ask, just ask why, and obviously do it with good intent and as a collaboration and as a partner, but help them understand how you evaluate their problem. And then by doing that and having that conversation, you also are building a shared understanding and getting away from the service center model and more towards like collaboration model. Yeah, it goes exactly to what Anthony was talking about earlier, this idea of building trust, right? Getting all of these different parties who seemingly have different outcomes in mind, right? But at the same time, you know, the outcome really is the same. And I think what you're talking about too, that asking why really uh, kind of focuses on the technology we bring into our organizations as well, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's cool to have the shiniest, coolest new toy, you know, within our organization, but what's the point? Why do we have that tool here? Right. So that it, it goes across the board. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it all has to start with a clear strategy. Um, and I think, you know, when you look in retrospect at projects you've done, whether from a leadership perspective or as a data professional, I would, you know, I would assert that like 90% of those projects could have just used more discovery and more problem definition. Uh, which ultimately gets us to better outcomes, you know, and helps firm that firm up that strategy and get us away from just going to shop for technology or going to build things from scratch just because the problem was put in front of us. Right. Yeah. There's got to be a point to everything. Right. And it kind of ties in. We've, we've come full circle on that. Um, let's talk about one last pitfall. Um, I like this one. We don't want to fall into the trap of letting our silos control us. Right. And frankly, nobody wants to be controlled by silos, right? Uh, so Anthony, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Why, why is that a pitfall that folks should look out for? Uh, yeah, sure. I, um, I like this one a lot as well. I, um, like you said, no one wants to be controlled by silos. And what we really mean here is, um, you know, the idea behind this one is, again, like as data leaders, we have a lot, a lot of different responsibilities. And one of them is to try to um, look out for silos that could form. Uh, I would say that, like I said, no company can avoid silos and silos aren't always a problem because they're so natural and they 
they always exist. So even no matter how small a company is, it, even if it was three people, um, if it was two, three engineers working on different parts of, of, a, of an application, like silos are naturally going to exist in the data that they're uh, collecting, uh, the data sets they're creating, et cetera. But as long as you know everyone knows where data is, they can access data that they need, um, it doesn't necessarily have to create an issue or it can go unnoticed. Uh, I'd say like once things start, you start realizing that it's creating, um, that data is hard to get to or people have questions on where to find information, um, then you've got yourself a, a data silo issue. And um, I would say this one kind of comes back to uh, always thinking about the bigger picture as a data, as a data leader. And uh, to Garrett's point, like asking why, and I'd say as a business partner, continue like always thinking with a business hat on and trying to make sure that other people are involved. Um, when you get a question, uh, even if it's from the CRO, let's say like the CR that the revenue organization might not be the only one that could benefit from that information um, or might benefit from that project. So you as a data a leader have the responsibility of connecting the dots, right? So you're the data expert, you know what data you have and you have to kind of connect the dots and, and make sure that uh, you have a lens on what other parts of the organization could benefit from, can benefit from this project as well. Um, and I'd say you have to take this, this um, mentality with you, even as you're evaluating new tools mm -hmm. um, and, in, and like making sure that the tools that you're looking at can integrate really well with the rest of your data stack. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say that that's exactly what I was thinking as you were talking about that, because the idea of these integration of tools across silos, you know, making sure that everything you know, applications can easily access the data that we need is, is super important. I wonder if you have an example of that. I know you work a lot with Salesforce, right? I mean, do you tell us a little bit about, you know, in a yeah. real world way, how that works. Yeah. So like being in the go-to-market um, part of talent, you know, Salesforce is definitely um, a key piece of my day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's really important, like I was saying, like the thinking about integration and how different pieces of software integrate with each other is, is super important here. And so like one analysis that I've, I've worked on recently is we've been trying to use um, some of the data that we can collect on product behaviors and use that to signal to our sales team, like whether or not they should reach out to a customer and, and whether or not that customer would be interested in a, a more robust um, product that we can offer. And um, we actually, we did a great analysis on this problem, found some really great insights, but after it was done, we, did, we didn't have a great way to tie those insights back into Salesforce so we can provide it back to the sales team. And so we kind of had created this data silo for ourselves where we couldn't integrate our findings back into the system that, that the end users were familiar with. And so we actually re rebuilt the analysis in a different tool that had Python capabilities that we could then use webhooks to tie that information and our findings back to the system so that the end users could actually find a benefit and tie it into their day-to-day -day work. Um, so it's a really great example of, of being mindful, uh, especially like throughout that process um, and thinking about the ways that, you know, if I'm going to need this later, um, make sure I'm right, using the right tools so that I can integrate this uh, with other pieces of, of my system. Um, and again, like avoiding this idea of like a data silo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes back into the vibe of kind of the, everything we've been talking about, the idea, don't look for silos, look for problems. When you do find the problem, break it down into manageable pieces, uh, take it step by step. Uh, we've used the word baby steps a couple of times uh, in our conversation, yeah. you know, just that idea of don't be overwhelmed and, uh, you know, just kind of look at things as the one, right? So those are some great examples of some of the pitfalls and the challenges. Thanks guys, both of you for sharing those. So now that we know what some of the common pitfalls are, and hopefully those who are watching here have been nodding at home or in their office and understanding, <laughs> yeah, these are things that I'm dealing with too. Um, what's next? I mean, you both had a lot of experience. Maybe we'll start with you, Anthony, you know, um, building, you know, getting to work of actually building the strategy. And you've done it again from enterprise to small business. What are some of the best practices in building that data strategy now that we kind of know what the landscape looks like a little bit? Um, yeah, I'd say it's some best practices, right? Like uh, I'd say it comes down to, um, again, like strategy is a, is a difficult aspect of this whole process. And I'd say some of the important pieces to, to focus on that we had talked about earlier were really like 
keeping a close tie to the business uh, stakeholders that you work with and always having like a business perspective so that you can kind of look at the, the data issue that you're facing uh, holistically and within the context of the greater business. Um, yeah, that's, that's always a challenge. And that's, that's certainly one of the things that you want to focus on as a, a data. Cool. And Garrett, I know that you, I mean, I, I want to bring it closer to home a little bit too. Um, you've got a great customer case uh, with Stitch proof that, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways that we take our own advice, you know, when it comes to the importance of a strong data strategy, talk a little bit about your experience and how Stitch went through this process. We'll take a look at your case study real quick. Yeah, for sure. So one of the things Anthony called out was, um, you know, not letting silos control you. And I think, you know, the Stitch product and how it helps customers is a great example of that. Um, I just wanted to share really quick um, a case study from Envoy, which is a uh, very much a hot startup in the office management space. Um, they help companies receive packages, uh, manage office space and access. Um, and they were finding themselves spending a lot of time working with silos or getting controlled by them because they had a bunch of different SaaS tools that their data scientists wanted to access to get at the underlying data. And they weren't able to do that without building and maintaining custom ETL pipelines um, to move that data to their Redshift data warehouse. Um, and so by, by using Stitch, they were able to set those pipelines up in a fully managed way um, so that they could actually spend more time you know, away from silos, actually working with all the, the data centralized in Redshift um, and apply you know, their data science models on top of that data. Um, so just a quick example of, you know, how one company, um, you know, in a very fast moving space growth stage was, you know, taking control of some of those data silos and turning that into a central source of truth. Very cool. Yeah. And anytime we can tell a story like that to actually kind of flesh out the theory and the idea, um, that's very important for a lot of folks. We have a few minutes left. I just wanted to give you both an opportunity to kind of give us some takeaways here. I mean, we've learned a lot, um, but now it's all about doing something with this knowledge, right? So what should our viewers be asking themselves as they start creating their own data strategy? Anthony, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. So I think um, I, I'll get, I think I have a couple of points to summarize the things that we talked about here. Um, so I think first of all, uh, there's this importance of trust and building strong relationships with your stakeholders is one that I, I couldn't stress enough. Um, it's so it's so important in building out a successful strategy because um, so much of that strategy just depends on building trust with the people that you work with. Um, and as data professionals, like trust is such an, is like so key because, uh, you know, we're presenting numbers that people at the end of the day have to trust, right? So like there's a, there's a lot of that in, um, in data strategy as well. Uh, I'd say that's one one piece of it. And I think a second piece, um, I want to tie it back to something I said earlier, which is that uh, progress should not be uh, ignored. So it's really, you know, it's a, it's a daunting thing, like working with data. Uh, but as we kind of said earlier, there's a, it's a journey and there's a lot of progress to be made on that journey, no matter where you are um, along that data, you know, along your data journey, right? Like, uh, some, in some ways, if you're early on in that in, in those stages, it's even better because you have so much room to grow. And if you're looking out for the right uh, problems problems and challenges, you can actually avoid them altogether. Um, so I'd say like those two things uh, are really key to this whole idea of having a successful data strategy. Uh, you know, one is again trust. Second, being uh, focusing on the progress that you can make, and I think communicating it out. Uh, is actually like super helpful as well. Um, and again, a responsibility as a data leader. Excellent. Garrett, what do you have to say? Totally agree. Um, I just add, you know, for my client work days, just ask why, uh, ask why three or four or more times and <laughs> work from there, you know, spend your time on, on what's going to move the needle um, and bring those folks along, you know, from the business with you and your thought process. Mm -hmm. Great. Hey, um, we are out of time. Uh, we absolutely uh, want to thank you both for being here. We want to thank everybody who is watching this as well. Uh, I think it's a great kickoff to our webinar series. And uh, again, Anthony, Garrett, thank you so much for bringing your expertise and your experience to this. Um, don't change a thing on your wall, Garrett. I, uh, <laughs> 
yeah, I, I, I think I'm just going to set up more calls with you just to see what you do with that wall space. And, and Anthony, uh, again, thank you so much for your expertise as well. I mean, just your experience from from the enterprise to SMB and, and you know, just as it's invaluable. Thanks very much. Um, keep an eye out, folks, uh, for a follow up email with a link uh, to our next webinar. Uh, you can get all that information on the, uh, the page and uh, hopefully you'll join us for other installments. Uh, but for now, appreciate your time. Thanks for being with us and uh, have a great day. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.